Let's start out with the gastric bypass first because it explains a lot of anatomy and physiology. So your esophagus, your swallowing tube, starts in the back of your throat, goes through your chest, and when it gets into the belly, it expands and becomes a stomach. And then it gets small again and becomes a small intestine. There's about 16 to 20 feet of small intestine all coiled up in there. Your liver's on the right side. There's two tubes of, that come out of the liver that carry bile. The liver makes bile from old broken down red blood cells and puts that bile into the first part of your intestine. And bile works like a detergent, like a soap, helps us break down the oils and fats in our food, make them easier to absorb. Uh, your gallbladder's here. Sometimes it gets stones in it. If one of those stones gets wedged in there, that's when people get sick with their gallbladder and have to get it out. Your pancreas is a digestive gland behind everything on the left side, and it adds into that same little opening enzymes that help us digest uh, proteins and fats and carbohydrates. So we swallow the food, it comes down the esophagus into the stomach. The stomach does not really absorb any nutrients. The stomach's just a storage bag. Let's us eat as fast as we can shovel it in and then run with the food in case we need to. There's a muscle at the bottom called the pylorus, and it's like a muscular ring or a donut that squeezes the bottom of the stomach closed. And normally it's closed. If you look in there with a scope, it just looks like a little pinpoint. A couple times a minute, that muscle will relax, let out about a tablespoon of food, and then squeeze down again. It has its own rhythm. And that rhythm is determined by how much fat and sugar is in the food. There's little sensors in this area. So that little bit of food comes out, mixes with the bile and the pancreas enzymes, and that chemically starts digestion. Then as the food moves through your small intestine, the nutrients are absorbed into your bloodstream through the microscopic blood vessels that line the wall of the intestine. Normal woman has about 16 feet of small intestine, man has about 20 feet. Now in the gastric bypass, we divide your stomach into two stomachs. A very small upper pouch that's separated from the main body of the stomach. We don't take out anything, we just close those ends off so that they don't leak and the two never join again. We measure from the beginning of the intestine down about a foot and then we divide this like we're cutting this 16 foot hose at one foot. And we take the far end, the long end, the end that would keep going, and we bring it up to here so that that X ends up up there. So I'm gonna bring this end up to here. This end here, we're gonna to sew to the side. We're gonna make a connection here. We're gonna make an opening in this upper pouch. We're gonna make an opening in the intestine, and we're gonna sew those two openings to each other. So now the food goes this way, okay? Acid is made in the lower part of your stomach, has its own blood supply, nerve supply, still makes acid still responds to stimulation from your brain. But this acid can no longer reach your esophagus, so the heartburn's gone on the first day. And for some people, that's a really important improvement. After their bypass surgery, they no longer have acid reflux, no longer have heartburn, and usually when that goes away, the asthma goes away. But the lower stomach still makes acid, the liver still makes bile, the pancreas still makes enzymes, everything is working normally probably three or four liters a day of juices are being made and are carried by this foot of intestine and put in downstream here now, okay? Everything only goes one way in the intestine. The distance between this connection here and this connection here is actually about five feet, all coiled up, about eight to 12 feet beyond. This is about one foot. Okay, so that's a standard gastric bypass, okay? We did not take out anything. Everything is still there. The operation works mainly because this upper pouch is small. It's about this big. Holds about half a sandwich. And you're full. This part of the stomach wall doesn't stretch good. Okay? When it starts to stretch, your brain will feel full. There is no more room. You're completely done. Put your fork in the sink. Uh, some patients after this tell me that if they're chewing on something and they notice that they're starting to feel full, they'll take their napkin and take out what's in their mouth. That after this, the difference between full and uncomfortable is small. So listen to your body. When it says full, quit. Okay, for me, full means slow down and start planning dessert. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean done. It means slow down a little while, you know. But after this, full really means done, okay. So when you feel full, quit. 
If you keep eating, the food stacks up in your esophagus, you'll burp, it'll be in your hand. Okay, so listen to your body. When it says full, you're done. And your meal will be small. Half a sandwich, a little piece of chicken, little rice, little beans, less than a cup, okay? Now this opening between the stomach and the intestine, I make it 12 millimeters, about a half inch, about the size of an M&M, so that the stomach empties solid slowly, so that you get a feeling of fullness. You feel full, you feel satisfied, I'm done, a couple hours before you feel like eating again. Controls the rate of emptying of solids. Now because that opening is restricted, you have to understand that anything that you swallow bigger than that, a hunk of apple, steak, anything bigger than an unbroken up M&M is coming back up. Okay, most women chew good. Us guys, we rip off a piece, mash it twice, bend our knees and swallow, and that won't work. Uh, but we'll get patients, you know, two or three years out, lost all their weight, all but forgotten about us, and they'll be late for a big meeting at work and worried about everything that's not ready for the big meeting and really hungry because they missed breakfast, and they'll wolf something down without thinking, and it'll come right back up, and they'll look at that. I didn't chew that at all. You know, it didn't, didn't kill them, but nobody likes to vomit, you know. So this means you need to sit down at breakfast time. There's a new concept, huh? You know, this means you need 10 minutes to eat your lunch where you're not doing three other jobs. Sit down, take a breath, say a prayer, let go a little bit of the rush and the stress of the day. Don't bring it in the meal and take it out on the food. Don't eat when you're driving. Don't eat when you're mad. That's when people tend to mess up because we're not thinking about the mechanics of eating. We're thinking about everything else. Now, normally food goes this way. This muscle lets out just a little bit even even the, uh, the liquids, um, immediately it mixes with the bile and the pancreas enzymes. Now the food is going into this five foot limb without that opening and closing muscle, without those digestive enzymes. Because of those changes, most people after bypass surgery find that food that's high in fat, food that's high in refined sugars makes them ill. The high fat, high sugar foods irritate this first five feet, makes you feel shaky, sweaty, crampy, nauseated, rushy, growly, like you ate something spoiled. Lasts about an hour until the food makes it down here where the digestive enzymes are mixing in and then things start to settle down. In fact, you'll still absorb those calories in the lower part. But next time you see that food, I bet it doesn't look as good. Imagine it's kind of like getting food poisoning from chicken salad. You know, it's a long time before chicken salad sounds like a good idea after that. So all fried foods, anything cooked in oil, mayonnaise, salad dressings, butter, sour cream, high fat meats like ribs and bacon, salami, cheap hamburger, fast food hamburger is half fat. That's what makes it so good. All desserts, all pastries, all candies, cookies, cannolis, either have too much sugar, too much shortening, too much butter fat. That's what makes them so good. So after this, your dessert is strawberries. You can have chicken or fish, cook it on the grill, bake it, broil it. You can have vegetables, you can't bread them and fry them. You can have pasta, you can't have an Alfredo sauce, it's the fat. So you learn how to make a great marinara sauce and you learn how to make great meatballs out of ground turkey. You know, instead of deep fried perch with tartar sauce, that old Michigan standard, you know, you have your fish on the grill, but you learn how to make a mango salsa to make it moist and interesting and zippy without having to fry it or use a mayonnaise-based sauce. You know, different style of cooking, different than what we grew up on. Real fruits, real vegetables, lean meats cooked in a lean way, and the sheriff goes home with you. And he's there every day and every night and every weekend and every Christmas and every birthday. And no matter how special that day is, that cake will make you sick because it has too much sugar, too much butter. So this shaky, sweaty, crampy, nauseated, rushy, growly is called dumping syndrome. This term dumping syndrome is an old term, probably the late 40s. It was used to describe, uh, remember back in, uh, when people used to have bleeding ulcers? You know, before these wonderful medicines like Zantac or Pepsid, we actually had to take out the lower half of the stomach for that ulcer to heal. Very similar operation, just a bigger pouch. And after that, those patients complained that they couldn't eat anything sweet or greasy. And that was called dumping syndrome. And it's the same mechanism, and it was considered to be a complication after their ulcer surgery that now they can't enjoy these foods. And some people think about it as a complication of their bariatric surgery. Other people think about it as more of a, a desirable side effect. Sort of helps you discipline your diet, at least initially, know, you know, knowing that the things you shouldn't be eating anyway, the high fat, high sugar, high calorie foods, will temporarily make you feel lousy. Okay? 
So this is gastric bypass. This is still the most common bariatric operation done in the United States. This has been the premier operation since the early 90s. It's been done since the 70s. And what's different now is that most of these we're able to do with the scopes, which is a lot easier on you instead of having to make a big incision. Mm -hmm.